Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 31 of the American Muslim Experience. My name is Zaki Hassan, and joining me, as always, is my good friend, Parvez Ahmed. Thank you, Zaki, and thank you, listeners, for joining us. Um, this will most likely be, if, if not will be, the last episode of 2015. It will most definitely be the last <laughs> unless you're planning on replacing me in the next week. <laughs> <laughs> Zucky, uh, for those who don't know, Zucky does most of our, uh, like, the, the, does the magic of post-editing and uh, post-production, as it were. Um, and so, yeah, uh, Zucky would be the person to, who would make that call. So, um, yes, this is the last episode of 2015. Uh, where did the year go, man? I feel like we were just, uh, yeah, just talking about, hey, this is the first episode of 2015 or the last episode of 2014, and here we are. So, Well, and, and this is going to blow your mind. In a few weeks, we'll be like, it's the first episode of 2016. <laughs> and then about a year from now, we'll be like, where did 2016 go? So time go. is yeah. moving in only one direction, which I just... Yes. Yeah. That's that's a, a sobering thought because uh, you realize as, as you see the gray hairs multiply, you're like, oh, no yeah. No kidding. No kidding. For whatever hair I have left on the top of my head, but yeah, <laughs> certainly, yeah. <laughs> but how have you been? I, I'm doing well. I'm doing. I'm doing great. Uh, I I feel uh, I feel refreshed. Uh, I'm looking forward to bringing in the new year. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we've. Uh, I'm I'm actually pretty excited. We actually, for the first time, I think, Zucky, we have a, like our our. I think three episodes in, we have guests lined up. Uh, you know, and, and ready to go. And so that's pretty exciting. So uh, stay tuned, folks. We've got some exciting folks coming in. Well, and and also worth mentioning, very exciting. We're very honored to be nominated uh, under the best podcast category in this year's Brass Crescent Awards, which honors uh, exciting stuff in the Muslim blogosphere slash social media. Um, and and this is this is an award that I've previously been nominated for for my my blog Zucky's Corner dot com uh, in the best blog category. But of course, uh, in that interim, we started the Diffuse Congruence Show. The response to which has been fantastic. So certainly, getting a nomination like this is very humbling. Very, we're very very honored to whoever Absolutely. nominated us. Mm-hmm. And uh, we only if if you want to vote for us, by the way. Uh, <laughs> You know, this sounds like a shame. We wouldn't, club. we wouldn't discourage you, but you know, no, if you that, want no. to love, yeah. Uh, you are listening to the show, so we presume that you are a fan or you're hate listening. But either <laughs> way, we're like the newsroom of podcasts where you just hate listen. Um, <laughs> but it, you, can, you can go to brasscrescent.org. And uh, check us out under under the best podcast category. And if you want to vote, uh, please do and, and spread the word and, and uh, let people know. We're, we're certainly excited to be doing this. So getting acknowledgement like this is, of course, pretty, pretty sweet. That is. That is. I absolutely. Um, I, was that – were the Brass Crescent Awards something that Sh- uh, Shahid Amanullah started or was he part of that? Do I, I don't know? know if he's. I don't know if he started them, but I do know he's involved in some. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a past guest, uh, yeah, yeah, friend that, of the show, Shahid, the friend moment. of the show, if you will. Yeah. Uh, uh, speaking of, uh, uh, I think uh, the kind of the response that we've been getting and feedback, uh, Zucky tells me we've got some. Uh, we've got some new listener reviews on iTunes. Always yeah, so, so uh, as we say at the end of each episode, if you like what we're doing, hit up iTunes, hit up Stitcher Radio, give us a star rating, give us a review, let us know what we're doing. And so some people took us up on that. So this is uh, from uh, Ani Baba, who says, being an American Muslim, love hearing from those in our community in this intimate manner. I'm just disappointed in myself for not finding this earlier. I've only listened to the first five episodes, but already giving it five stars because it's just great quality with fantastic guests and quality discussion. Keep up the great work. Wow. Well, don't and, be too hard on yourself. Uh, better late than never. So thank uh, you for... I, I disagree. I think that you should... <laughs> I, do give props. I do give props for, for uh, the intimate manner in which we talk because uh, we record in front of an open fire and... Uh, it's it that's right. lit and it's it's it is it is indeed very intimate. So it's nice. that's right, and 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 very uh, for this time of the year, we've got chestnuts roasting, and we've got yeah, all that stuff going on too. Very true. <laughs> uh, 
This is from uh, N. Khan, who says, This podcast is such a great way to understand the backgrounds of today's American Muslim leaders. I thoroughly enjoy listening to it. So thank you for that. And, thank and, you. Yeah, and, and you know, that, that's, that's the uh, certainly a common thread that I get in a lot of certainly the face-to-face interactions I've had with yeah. people who listen to the show. It's a way of getting past sort of the sound bites and the speeches, just having conversations. And that's, you know, I think originally when we were batting around names for this podcast, we were thinking about American Muslim conversations. Right. Uh, right. Is, and, and that's, even though that's not the, the name of the show, that's the intent of the show is exactly that. We're just, we're just chatting. We're having fun. Uh, talking about stuff that is of of seriousness, but hopefully we're not being too serious about it. That's yeah, yeah. I think I think that's that's a great way to kind of summarize what we try to do, at least. Uh, and yeah, uh, I do. Yeah, and I, and I, I agree. It's always it's always uh, heartwarming, you know, to get face to face feedback when people say, "Oh, I've been a long time listener," or you know, just people who I don't even know or I or I've known for many many years, and then they're like, "Oh, yeah. By the way, I listen to the podcast. Great podcast." Because I'm not out there. You know, I've got my business card ready to go and telling people to listen. So uh, it's always it's always nice. It, it really is. Um, but um, in uh, I guess uh, to uh, to kind of uh, piggyback a little bit about what you said about trying to keep it not too serious, uh, we decided for this episode that we were going to unabashedly uh, let our geek on, right? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so essentially. Um, we're kind of like, you know, let's close out the year in a fun yeah. way. And, and Pervez and I are both Star Wars fans. And, and there is, um, my understanding is that there's a new movie that's out right now. And I, they, I'm, you know, I'm hearing whisperings yeah. online. So I, yeah, I've got to go check Rumblings. It. Mumblings. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so, uh, but no, so I we think, like, in a, I mean, we, jokes aside, I mean, the, the movie just killed. I, mean, I think by the time... The listeners listen to this episode. It would have already, I think, surpassed uh, seven hundred and fifty million worldwide. Worldwide, yeah. It'll, it's it's probably going to cross four hundred million dollars today. This is Christmas Day, by the way, that we're recording. Yeah, right. And and uh, yeah, so big monster hit, and it's obviously a cultural force, no pun intended, that we couldn't help but uh, spend some time talking about. And and essentially, uh, Pervez was like, "Hey, let's talk about Star Wars," and I said, "You know what?" Don't need to twist my arm to talk about Star Wars. I'm always happy to do that. And, and I think for the, for, for, I think I, I have shared this story before, but but the first time I ever meet Zach, and I'll say it again because it is poignant. To, at the, you know, because we are talking about Star Wars, uh, is, is is, and I've kind of already given the reveal. But uh, is that is that uh, the first time I ever met Zucky was at a as, at a uh, at a mutual uh, friends, my relatives' mutual friends' wedding. Uh, and uh, I, I, I'm, I'm making my way through the crowd, trying to find a table where I know, you know, more than three people, uh, because this was an out-of-town wedding for me. Uh, this was in Chicago. Uh, I was visiting. And uh, I, I, I hear somebody uh, basically it, it very forcefully and very, uh, I, I, I have to say, Zucky, very, very, very eloquently, basically taking down Jar Jar Binks. And I thought, <laughs> I don't know this guy, and there's probably about two people on this table that I do know. But what I do know is that I will join in any Jar Jar Binks bashing session. <laughs> so that was Zucky. Uh, so this would have to have been June of '99, I would think. It, it was. It was. It was. It was actually. Yeah. It, it was uh, Nora's wedding. I mean, you, you and I both know. And oh. um, yeah, it was her uh, Walima dinner. And uh, yeah, there you were uh, talking about your thoughts on the Phantom Menace. So, so in, so in other words, the roots of diffused congruence can <laughs> literally be traced to Star Wars. That's right. That's right. I mean, this is, this is years before Zucky marries my cousin. So, you know, again, and, uh, and we, we find out later that I had attended your brother's wedding in Houston and so on. But at that point you were just a complete stranger. But what we shared in common was this love for Star Wars, but at the same time, you know, disappointment <laughs> in, in June, you know, in June of circa June 99 about, about the, about the new prequel movie. And here we are flash forward. What Zucky 16 going on 16, 17 years later. Yeah. Right. 16 plus and, years. Yeah. Right. 16 plus years later. And we've got a new movie to talk about. And I am very happy to say that it is not uh, the Phantom Menace. <laughs> well, and in order to have this conversation, in order to facilitate this dialogue, we invited on somebody who uh, I think is uh, very much suited to have this conversation with, 
And that is Omar Muzaffar, who is a very old friend of mine, and yours, Pervis. That's right. That's right. So Omar lectures across Chicago, teaching courses on religion, literature, history, and film. He's given well over a thousand talks on Islam since 9-11. In 2009, Roger Ebert named him as one of his far-flung correspondents. In 2011, the Graham School of the University of Chicago honored him with an Excellence in Teaching Award in Humanities, Arts, and Sciences. He's a lifelong Chicagoan involving himself in various educational, social service, and charitable projects. And uh, Omar also was the deciding factor in my going to Columbia College, Chicago. I don't know if Omar knows that. Oh, wow. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Wow. Thank you so much for joining us. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's uh, your fault, if you ask me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm sorry, auntie. <laughs> I didn't know. So now, Monty, wife, uh, yeah, you have a whole basically, list of people. everyone in my life is is glaring at you with with an accusatory <laughs> finger right now. Okay. Thank you. So, so uh, Star Wars came out last week. It's already the uh, biggest opening weekend of all time. It's very possibly going to replace Avatar as the number one uh, movie of all time, at least domestically. Uh, lots of conversation. Kind of interesting. The the reviews have generally been positive. Although, uh, not over the moon positive. It seems like most people are saying, well, it's good enough and that's good enough. Mm -hmm. now, yeah, I mean, I think – I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I mean, that's I'm, – I'm curious about your thoughts on this, Omar. Yeah, uh, I think uh, it is impossible uh, to have a perfect Star Wars film because uh, it taps so deeply into our imagination for such a long period of time. There is no way you could have a movie, uh, a Star Wars movie anymore, unless it was the revelation of the Quran itself um, that would <laughs> that would get all the fanboys happy. Um, but I think it did a pretty good job. Uh, there are some some gripes that I do have about it that I'm sure we'll talk about. Uh, yeah, and this is something that me as uh, well, I'll put it like this: when I walked out of Revenge of the Sith on on opening night, I was very, very grateful for the 30-year hold that the film has had on my imagination. And wow. I was also grateful to finally shed that and finally wow. begin my life as, as an adult male. <laughs> <laughs> well and, said. Well said. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, 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 yeah, go ahead. so you walked out of Revenge of the Sith not – happy with that film i'm assuming well i mean uh i saw phantom menace i did not feel the way many of my co-fanboys felt i did not feel that my childhood was completely ruined and and to really hear this is this is gonna show you the schizophrenia of my being uh the same <laughs> year the same year that phantom menace came out uh the first volume of Sayyid Qutb's Tafsir of the Quran came out. And if you grew up in America, you knew that there was this volume thirty that was always translated. And That's there was right. this legendary, you know, first through twenty nine that everyone had been waiting for. And and so both of those happened within a few months of each other. And when I read the the first volume of Sayyid Qutb's Tafsir, I was like, seriously? This is this is what I waited for. And 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 it's totally I'm going to earn a lot of the ire of a lot of people for saying that. Uh, but part of the reason uh, was the same problem that Phantom Menace had is that there is no way it could meet the hype of 30 years or however many years it was. Hmm, wow. Right. That's not to say it was a masterpiece. Uh, <laughs> I think the, the fundamental uh, gripe that I had is that uh, watching it just as a film on its own, I just wasn't emotionally invested. You know, uh, and that's how I felt about the ending of Force Awakens. Hmm, that, interesting. Okay. You know, you had that gigantic uh, uh, Star Killer, which I mean. Well, yeah. You know, oh, yeah. Hold on one second. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. folks. We are absolutely one hundred percent going to be spoiling aspects of this. <laughs> so I, I just realized as we're talking, uh, yeah. if you have not seen it and you intend to, hit pause. Go watch it and then come back. But from here on in, expect the film to be ruined for you. So don't blame us. Please go on. Okay. Okay. No, I, actually, I wanted to make that caveat too, Zaki. Yeah. But before you know, Omar, before yeah. we jump right in, uh, yeah, actually, I, I think just I think it'd be it'd be interesting uh, if if all three of us could share because I think that I mean, not knowing 
kind of where, where you know like not wanting to date yourself you don't have to necessarily date yourself but like in I'm terms an old of man. your own yeah your own <laughs> history <laughs> and, and connection like you talk about that history and connection and you talk about like sort of shedding that you know at, at 19 what is it 2007 uh, 2005 when, yeah. when Sith comes out um, so, so to maybe talk a little bit about, and then, you know, Zucky, you can, you can also do the same and I'll do the same, which is sort of your, like, what's your relationship to Star Wars? Like, sure. do you, you were old enough probably to see at least one of the original trilogy movies in theaters. I, I assume. I have seen all of the original trilogies in their first runs. Uh, so wow. the, the Varguses who lived across the street took me. <laughs> to the River Oaks theater to go watch, uh, this movie that I had no idea about. My parents were, were hardcore movie fans, uh, growing yeah. up in Chicago. Uh, yeah. and sometimes they'd go see movies that were not appropriate for, for us. And so they didn't know what babysitters were. They just come from Pakistan. And, and so, yeah, they would leave me at home alone. And that was fine back then. And, but, uh, when I was a little kid, they took me to see the exorcist. I was probably about two or three years old. I still remember Linda Blair's hair turn or head turning around. Huh. I remember her puking. <laughs> uh, Wait, you, said you, were like, you said you were three when you watched that? Yeah. yeah. Wow. All right. And, and <laughs> it, it, I think Omar is automatically sort of, uh, or unassumingly dating himself. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, Unabashedly too. Unabashedly. <laughs> Um, no, you know, I find that, fact, you know, and, and it's funny having heard Zucky talk about sort of his own sort of, you know, experiences. Like, I think you were, what, five when you watched Rambo. First um, Blood. There's this sort of common, yeah. I think there's a common trope here because I, I, I saw highly inappropriate movies, uh, you know, before I was, you know, age eight. And so uh, certainly I can relate to the same thing about the sort of like, I, I think our immigrant parents uh, – just not having a filter in terms of what we should be watching. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, say, I, I saw First Blood in the theater, and the word blood is in the title. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, I mean, so it's funny you say that because my, my, my mother always tells me very fond, like very, very fondly that she was maybe eight months pregnant or nine months pregnant with me, and they went and saw The Exorcist in the movie theater. <laughs> So to talk about your to talk about your exorcist story there, yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's it's wild. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sorry, go on. Uh, you were, yeah. you were you so were Star Wars. So mm-hmm. the uh, uh, so these neighbors took me to go see it, and uh, I was just absolutely blown away. Uh, yeah. I remember uh, as this kid taking my my Coke and popcorn cups and using them as as uh, as Tie Fighter guns during the film, and. My, you know, Mrs. Vargas thought that was kind of strange. I didn't understand what was so strange about it. And, <laughs> and yeah. And then shortly after that, my parents took me to the store called Venture, which was sort of like a I low-budget Target. Yeah, of course. Exactly. Of course. I love Venture. Yeah. And, um, uh, oh, actually, just before that, my father had gone on a business trip up to Wisconsin, and he came back with a toy. I asked him to bring me a toy, so he brought me a land speeder. And then when we went to Venture, uh, I wanted a Luke Skywalker Star Wars figure for it. They tried to buy me a, a skateboard, and and I wanted the Star Wars figure, so they relented. And I just wonder how different I would have been <laughs> as, as a human being, as someone physically fit. Um, the direction of your life was inadvertently set, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> wow. So, so yeah, it. Uh, uh, I was that child generation that the yeah. first movie captured, and along with so many other people, and growing up playing with all my friends, trying to figure out what was going to be in the next film, and then when Return of the Jedi w- uh, had come and gone, spent you know, what amounted to 16 years with too many conversations with friends and relatives trying to figure out what's going to take place in, in episode one, two, three and seven and seven, eight, nine. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, and, and so, that's kind of, that's the problem that those prequels had when you think about it is that mm-hmm. it, 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 the fact that it was that generation gap between films, between mm-hmm. trilogies, Mm-hmm. Made, made, no matter no matter what Lucas would have done, and and the films are deeply flawed, no doubt. But no matter what he did, could could measure up. Nothing could measure up to what people had imagined. Mm-hmm. 
Right. Yeah. That, because you're talking about, and again, I'm, like like my like my connection to Star Wars is very very similar to Omar's, yeah. uh, other than the fact that. I, I don't have, although my parents must have taken me, but I don't really remember being, mm-hmm. you know, uh, seeing uh, Star Wars, uh, I guess, episode four or whatever, technically, A New Hope in movie theaters. However, I do very vividly remember going and seeing Return of, uh, sorry, Empire Strikes Back. Yeah. And, and like you, I mean, you talk about venture, but I remember, and again, you, you want to talk about acceptable behavior in the 80s or whatever it was, or, or they see parents, but like, I remember being, we would go to like, say, Kmart, and I uh-huh. would literally be left in the toys section. And meanwhile, my parents would go finish their shopping. Exactly. And, back, and they'd come back and pick me up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was that was that was my childhood, and that might have been too much of my adulthood, but it was definitely my childhood. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, now, and now all of us here being parents, you know, I, I think about that now, and I'm like, wow, I couldn't even imagine, you know, doing that with my kids. Uh, well, I mean, I tried. And, yeah, <laughs> it's, not, it's not a good idea. I think Zucky tries every day too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, the kids leave me, and then I stay in the Star Wars aisle, and they, just, <laughs> and they come back and pick me up. <laughs> But, uh, no, but but absolutely, and I remember, you know, as a as sort of yeah, and and always wanting to pick up yet another, uh, you know, uh, action yes. figure, and uh-huh. and just insisting, and we'd have fights, and my parents would sometimes relent and say yes, mm-hmm. but oftentimes it was a no, mm-hmm. you know, um, like for example, I never had, I never got the Millennium Falcon I wanted, and I think that has scarred my yeah. childhood. Every- <laughs> I had an X wing fighter, and I had Darth Vader's tie. I, I had the X wing yeah. fighter too, with the little yeah. damage stickers and everything. Yes. I think I got yes. it for my eighth birthday. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, I even owned Princess Leia. Good. What does that tell now, you about me? Now, was it Slave Leia or was it like – No, no, no. This, this was uh, Halal Star Wars number one. But, uh, <laughs> okay. yeah, Star Wars. Yeah. Yeah. Well, see, now, th- now this is interesting. Now, obviously, my, my experience yeah. is Please, uh, a little bit after the fact with you guys because I, yeah. I came into the world a couple of years after Star Wars did. But So, so my exposure to it was always as a, as a present thing. It's just a, a fact – yeah. Of, of existence, you know, and so I mentioned this on, on a commentary track that I did on my other show that I, you know, I never got to have that experience of seeing the Star Destroyer come yeah. overhead and, and, you know, and being awed by it because I was just like, well, this is how movies are. Yeah, right, and, right. You know, and so, you know, um, mm. Return of the Jedi was kind of my first awareness of, mm-hmm. of the merchandising and everything else. I was, uh, let's see, I would have been. Uh, just under four years old when that movie came out, and I, mm-hmm. you know, I remember very distinctly having a Return of the Jedi cereal bowl and and a mm-hmm. belt buckle and all that stuff. And, but you know, for for me, it was always in the past tense. Mm-hmm. And and this is something that that I mentioned in my thoughts about the Force Awakens is that for the first time ever, when it comes to this franchise, I have no idea what's going to happen next. Mm-hmm. That's because, fascinating. Yeah. You know, yeah. Because because even. <laughs> the original trilogy it was like well i knew how it ended because i i just viewed it holistically and then the prequels well we knew how it was going to end anyway mm-hmm. but you yeah. know zucky I, I think you know going back to a point you you were you you, you made uh, earlier and i think I, I kind of sort of cut cut you off and i kind of we, we kind of brought the conversation back to sort of our own connection to star wars but um you were talking about how there was that entire generation i think people that are represented certainly here but you know probably even more so with like omar and myself who kind of mm-hmm. Were, were, you know, were growing up, you know, with the movies as they were coming out concurrently, mm-hmm. uh, and then the being obsessed with the toys and the merchandising and the, sh- I, you know, I had Empire Strikes Back, you know, Star Wars, I'm uh, sorry, Empire Strikes Back, you know, uh, uh, bed, uh, like, like, you know, yeah. Like, that, yeah, yeah, the uh, what is it? Bed covers. Uh, yeah, that set that I would sleep yeah. on, right? Exactly. So, so just growing up like that, um, I think no matter what, the prequels were gonna let us down because of mm-hmm. the fact that by the time the prequels would come out or start coming out, we would have, you know, we were now young men in our twenties, late, maybe or mid to, you know, I think it was what mid twenties. Right. And uh, married, maybe some of us were married. So uh, like an entire, there was that entire, like you said, a generation had passed mm-hmm. in between the movies. And I think that really amounted to, uh, not having, notwithstanding the fact that the movies were deeply flawed, but that I think also had a lot, a lot to do with what sort of why that initial reaction to Phantom Menace was so visceral from the fan base. And and that to me is so fascinating because I I think that the prequel film, the reaction that we've seen to the prequel films is unlike anything I've seen before or since from fans of a series. 
<laughs> which is this – it's almost like you – It's and, and this is – considering our show, this is like a bad metaphor. But you're, you're, in, a, you're in a relationship with somebody and, and uh, uh, you're passionately in love with them and then you break up and you passionately hate them. Yeah. And it's this – it's this very extreme fulcrum, which is which is interesting to me because I would say I, I don't think I was ever uh, I ever bounced as hard as that. But I mean, we saw we saw it in the reaction. We saw it in you know George Lucas ruined my child and all this stuff. <laughs> I mean, you know, and, and I mean the poor guy has. I mean, I my heart goes out to him mm-hmm. because yeah yeah go ahead. Yeah, well, I mean, I I feel like he sold the franchise out of desperation just to be rid of this all this baggage that <laughs> he did not want, you know. Yeah, you know, I just found myself thinking that if someone really feels that their childhood was ruined because That's of the correct. prequels, okay, <laughs> it's not George Lucas who ruined their their childhood; it's their parents who ruined their childhood. <laughs> you know, and that's where we should draw our attention to. You know, That's but, true. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know. So, so this is the, the 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 prequel experience. This is the, my my contention is that it did, if nothing else, it lowered the bar for what we want out of the, these films. Yeah, uh, and I think that was probably its greatest blessing. Sure, that it drew all of our attention. It drew Hollywood's attention to uh, to have to make the films fantastic. I mean, all the films, including Phantom Menace, were were monster hits. Right, and. But still, uh, everyone realized the pressure that they were under to, to, to deliver. So. so so lifelong Star Wars fan, uh, you started uh, getting this at the beginning. Uh, did it deliver? And if so, how? If not, why not? Yeah. So, so again, uh, I knew going in that there's no way it could match whatever I felt was in my imagination, even if there was nothing in my imagination. And... <laughs> And, I mean, the basic question was going to be <clears throat> the same Hollywood question. Do you want to find out what happens next? A scene happens. Do you want to find out what happens next? And in some points, yes. There's that huge uh, uh, event that happens in the middle of the film with Kylo Ren and his father. Right? Yeah. I mean, should we talk about it? Should we say what it is? Let's, let's yeah. get into it. We, we're spoiler. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Beyond the spoiler I mean, wall. <laughs> so, so I watched you know, the trailers, and like everyone else, I watched all the videos about the trailers and the, read the articles about the trailers trying to figure out what's going on. And I thought, oh, she must be like Han and Leia's daughter. Uh, Kylo Ren must be Luke uh, uh, dressed up, and who knows what he's doing. Uh, oh. And then Kylo Ren takes off his mask, and suddenly I had flashbacks of John Travolta and the Sweat Hogs. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I, thought, I think I actually saw something. a meme of that. That is so funny you say that because um, I don't know about you, but I had never seen Adam Driver in anything. So, uh, yeah, or, I don't I mean, frankly, I hadn't seen any three, any of the three. Uh, yeah, the well, big there's three. four if you include yeah. Isaac. Uh, well, no, I, I was going to say uh, the uh, uh, the actor who plays Poe Dameron. Oh yeah, Oscar yeah, right, right. yeah. He's I'd I seen Oscar there. Isaac in a few movies. Yeah, yeah, and so. So the moment where uh, where Han Solo is talking to Kylo Ren on the bridge, uh, I think because my expectations were so low, that scene was shocking. Sure. And I think uh, that scene really, really worked because it had me gasp. Huh. Like, I can't believe they killed Han Solo. I even yeah. remember... Reading that George Lucas originally wanted to kill Han Solo and return the Jedi, but changed it because he wanted to make it much more happy. And so it still shouldn't have been a surprise, but mm. uh, it was well, a really I mean, good surprise. Yeah, go ahead. Right. And, and there's also, I think, I think, well, there's so much to talk about there, but um, yeah. what, I, what I did like about that, what, what I did like is what was what the filmmakers didn't do or, or, or cast in didn't do, which is that. Um, which is to to make the reveal that Han Solo and that that that, that, that Kylo Ren was Han Solo and Leia's son early uh-huh. on, and it's something mm-hmm. that almost sort of Snoke mentions almost in passing, right? In, uh-huh. the, in that, and so there wasn't the big "I am your father" moment, and I yeah. think that right. had there been that "I am your father" moment on the bridge, um, it would have been just on the nose in terms of like trying to capture, you know, trying to go back. Yeah, and, right. It would have been too forced. Yeah. Right, or to Empire. Now, so going in, you didn't – did you – like in terms of – forget about expectations, but just in terms of what you thought was going to happen or who the characters were, you kind of alluded to it, but you didn't think that they would kill off a major character? I I expected at most that they would kill off Chewbacca. <laughs> sure. 
You know, okay. uh, he's like a major character, but he yeah. doesn't talk, and you got to wonder: did anyone actually ever understand what he was saying, or are they just like you know, just <laughs> making it up, making him feel <laughs> better? Yeah, uh, I really thought Chewbacca was going to die. Interesting. And, See, interesting. I, but, it's funny because yeah. I I went in and I was and yeah. and. I, I and Pervez will tell you this. I had basically uh, the, after the second trailer, I was on shutdown. I wasn't really following any of the behind the scenes stuff, but I was just looking at it in terms of uh, the the symmetry from from trilogy to trilogy. I was like, every trilogy starts by killing off an elder statesman character. Uh, interesting. interesting. And and then I was like doing the math. I was like, well, Han, Harrison Ford's probably walking away with a small fortune to be in this movie. Mm-hmm. And I thought about Chewie, and I was like, well, you can find any seven foot tall guy and put him in the chewy suit mm-hmm. so who can who can they afford to keep around yeah <laughs> and so i went in i was like he's probably not going to be in any more of these beyond this and and the other thing was like harrison ford was way too happy when he was out promoting this movie <laughs> It's the joy of somebody who doesn't ever have to wear that leather jacket again. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. for me, for me, it was the mo- when he steps onto that catwalk. Yeah, I was like, all right, it's coming. You know, yeah. oh, interesting, interesting. Yeah. I had no clue whatsoever. Yeah. Wow, that's that's yeah. very interesting. I, I was, I think, uh, in my first viewing, I saw it with Zucky, in fact, yeah. And, and yeah, I, I kind of went in with the same expectation that. They were going to kill off a major sort of like one of the like Zucky said, one of the elderly, you know, elder statesman characters. And that would have been either Luke or Han Solo. And mm-hmm. I just didn't see it being Luke Skywalker. And I just felt that just given sort of Harrison Ford's own, you know, personal. I mean, I think he wanted it. I think he agreed that that Han Solo should have been killed in, mm-hmm. in Return of the Jedi. And I so mm-hmm. there was certainly that. Um but let me ask you. Let me ask both of you. And I and I don't think Zucky, you and I haven't I haven't talked about this. But when was the moment as you were watching the movie that you realized? Because uh, for like a lot of fans are saying it was the opening crawl. But when did you realize that okay, this is going to be not the Star Wars of the prequels? Huh. Uh, that's a that's a that's a good question. Uh, it's going to take me a few minutes to to. To think. Well, while, while you process that, like, like how yeah. about how about you, Zeki? Yeah, well, for me, it was very early. It was it was the the moment that we're on the planet, the, the we're on ja- Jakku. So mm-hmm. this is you know the first three minutes of the movie or whatever it is, and we're we're in a we're in an we're in a practical world, and there's a practical X-wing fighter, and it's it's clearly not shot against a blue screen, and it's very obvious. Uh, visually, that that's the case. So for me, it 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 drew my mind aesthetically to The Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi, just in terms of the tactile nature of the world that we were in. Mm-hmm. And it's very, I mean, it's unmistakably distinct visually from the world of the prequels, which is very mm-hmm. insular and very uh, obviously artificial. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think I think for me, I just uh, the thought didn't cross my mind as soon as I heard that Disney was taking everything over, and they pulled in J.J. Abrams. <laughs> and mm. my concern was that because it was a Disney movie, it was going to be a Disney princess movie. And <laughs> you know, like Brave comes out after Disney officially uh, takes everything over, and Brave is Pixar's first Disney princess film. And sure. that wouldn't mean that it's a bad film for me. Uh, you know, I have a bunch of daughters. I shouldn't even say it that way. You know, I have my daughters that I, you know, <laughs> that I'd like them to see, you know, positive, positive right. uh, female figures. But I already had a sense that this is where the story arc was going to go. Mm. And and my concern was that, okay, J.J. Uh, Abrams' last few big movies were, for example, like the Star Trek films. And I was really disappointed by the direction the second Star Trek film took by, uh, I don't know, have you two seen the film? I'm sure yeah, 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 and yeah. I think it's all together. Here. Oh, okay. So you guys see a lot of movies together. I yeah, hope your families are happy. But anyway, Actually, so. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Surprisingly, we don't. It just so happens, yeah. that, right? That's kind of funny. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Those are the ones we saw. <laughs> Only J.J. So, Abrams movies, basically. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know. Right. So, you know, I was amazed that that second Star Trek movie was taking the route of having a major character die, and this time it was going to be Kirk who died. Right. But then I remember there was a conversation about the Tribbles and the, how the Tribbles were coming back from life, and I thought, oh, no, no, don't go that direction. Don't get direct that direction. <laughs> and, yeah, and so Kirk survives. And so I was afraid that this film was just going to be safe. Sure, um, sure. And uh, I think that was part of the reason why I was totally shocked by, by Hans, Hans' death. 
Mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. you know what's so fascinating about about uh, killing off Han Solo is you would think that that was like in order to get Harrison Ford to show up, they had to basically <laughs> write it into the contract. He because it's one of the, he's like stabbed through the heart, falls into chasm, planet blows up. It's it's like him making he's like pointing to the contract. Z, are you sure? You know. <laughs> And and apparently in the earlier drafts he made it all the way to the end. Oh wow! That yeah. that was something they decided in the rewrite process, which I find. I mean, I mean, I think oh, Harry wow. Ford was ecstatic about that, but it, it, initially the plan was that uh, the, he, him and Princess Leia would essentially get back together, and that's their arc in the movie. Mm. 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 Yeah, I was. I did think that in terms of the the dramatic uh, 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 growth of the film itself. I did find myself thinking that that death was too powerful of a moment. And that was probably part of the reason why I didn't feel much about the, their star killer thing getting, getting destroyed. Sure. Uh, as it is, there, there wasn't really too much buildup. It's like, Hey, let's go in and shoot like yeah. the video games, all these places. And then done. It's gone. Right. Uh, right. But almost if they had a montage going back and forth between the two, uh, I think that might've been much stronger. But, uh, well, well and, and the it, whole Star Killer base. Yeah. I mean, to me, that the the mechanism of of that uh, the, the plot mechanism is problematic mm-hmm. uh, because it's presented to us as the bigger, badder Death Star. Yeah, but it feels like it, they take it out much more easily than the original Death Star or the second. Yeah, Death Star. I mean, having uh, Finn, he he says that yeah, I was just uh, I was a sanitary agent or something, and he happens to know where the hole is to, to, to destroy the whole Death Star. Uh, right. I find myself thinking, seriously? Seriously? Right. Uh, maybe that's, that's why true. you guys keep losing. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, I mean, when you think about... <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and even, I mean, the, the as I say, the Empire, the, the First Order, they're very nonchalant about the fact that the planet, their base is about to blow up. They're like, oh, yeah, hey, it's blowing up. We should probably blow up. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah. Maybe that was maybe that was part of the, the, the plot. It's like we'll make a gigantic Death Star that there's no way they can miss. But I, and, and I uh, said I said this yeah. elsewhere. I said this on my other show. I was like the mere fact that Star Killer Base exists to me is yeah. a real black mark on the Republic. <laughs> because when you think about it, I mean it, they didn't build that thing overnight. Mm-hmm. It probably took a while. They had to test it, I'm assuming. Yeah. And you think the Republic people would be like, hey, didn't there used to be a couple stars there that don't exist anymore? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Maybe we should check that out. Maybe, like, maybe uh, they started building it at the same time they were built, they built the, the first Death Star. And then when they saw that one explode, they're like, oh, no. And right. then the second one explodes. I'm like, oh, seriously? <laughs> oh, man. So let's just go through the motions, let our Death Star, our Star Killer die. You know, you, you know Zucky, like like you, you you raised the issue of like the Republic and and their relationship with the with the First Order. I I, I felt like because of, because the prequels were so sort of you know wrought with like political you know all the all the all the all the politics of like in in the, that were presented in the prequels. There was a there was such a conscious departure from that that in in Force Awakens that. They, they don't even really talk about well, what is the republic, and you know, it's almost what too is much the... of a departure. They, I think, they bent exactly, too far the exactly, mm-hmm. exactly. And so we don't really, and I think that added to the fact that when the Star Killer does demonstrate its 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 capability uh, by destroying those what four planets or three planets or whatever it was. Mm-hmm. You don't really feel the the fact that you know it was like like again you know going back to the first movie and by that I mean a new hope and when Alderaan is destroyed there's that moment you have you you know you you, you certainly feel the moment whether it's just you know even if it's just purely through Leia's reaction to it but you certainly feel something whereas in this movie I felt oh okay they destroyed a whole bunch of planets and now the Republic is over. And it's you know yeah you know yeah as so I, I I felt like you said Zucky like it was almost too much of a departure mm-hmm. um, yeah and I think um, that's also consistent with with J uh, J Abrams uh, in, again going back to the Star Trek films mm-hmm. uh, there is a scene in the in his first Star Trek film where yeah. a planet is destroyed and I still don't feel that he had as much emotional depth in those moments uh, as you mentioned uh, the the scene in the original Star Wars. Leia is disappointed. Ben Kenobi sits down during that right. chess game. He says, right. I, feel, I feel as though a million voices just cried out. Mm-hmm. You 
Yeah, so. I agree. Agree. Um, so no, I mean, I think we we we, we touched on this, but like, uh, uh, you know, Omar, you were talking about, you know, sort of after Disney's takeover and the princess movie phenomenon and things like that. Um, I, I was certainly pleased. Again, as the father of two daughters, I mean. Uh, you know, trying very desperately, <laughs> uh, as, as as parents we often do, to try to get our children into into things that we grew up on. Uh, mm -hmm. But like, and, and just not having my children really love the the original trilogy as much. I mean, they certainly mm -hmm. liked them and they enjoyed them as movies. Mm -hmm. But uh, what I loved, as far as the new one was concerned, was that. Um, here you have a very, very strong female character, a uh, mm -hmm. female lead, and 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 I, you know, I, I think I wrote, the, I, I texted this to Zucky afterwards, but I was saying, you know, outside of like maybe uh, the character of Riley, is it, yeah, Riley in the in the in the aliens, a, a alien movie, Ripley, 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 sorry, Ripley in the alien movies, Believe it or not. I, I can't really think of a more sort of powerful, strong, independent female character. Yeah, I mean, uh, essentially like the James Cameron film. So you have uh, what's his name's mom, John Connor's mom, Sarah Connor, in the mm -hmm. Terminator films. Good point, right? Uh, in term, uh, uh, as far as sci-fi is concerned, I mean, the unfortunate version of that is something that came long before all of those, which is Jane Fonda in Barbarella. Sure. And, and uh, even, I mean, one thing I appreciated about the the Star Wars character is that she was being a, a, a human being with all of her dimensions. Uh, I think in the James Cameron characters, uh, basically we had women who were taking on the role of being tough men. Mm -hmm. And that I think uh, might have worked for that time, but I think now that that approach is dated. Uh, That's an um, excellent point, yeah, mm -hmm. because I agree with you. In, in, in terms of the character of Rey in, in, in The Force of Awakens, you know, you see her. You see certainly her her, her vulnerability. The fact mm -hmm. that she has this connection to a family that left her on that mm -hmm. planet, and her struggling on her own. And th those are some really, really powerful moments. I felt mm -hmm. in, in in the new movie. Yeah, I thought that was really, really strong. You're right, yeah. right. And and I think and not enough can be said about again this new cast of, of mm -hmm. characters. I mean, they extra extraordinary performances, I felt, especially for a Star Wars movie. Because mm -hmm. let's face it, I mean, even when we go back and look at the original trilogy, I mean, you know, maybe you can say, okay, Harrison Ford, you know, really brings it. But as far as like Mark Hamill and, and, and Carrie Fisher and, and you know, they weren't very strong actors even back in the eighties, right? So. Yeah, I mean I mean their characters didn't have as much uh have as much dimension except mm. uh, according to what they were witnessing. Like much of we lived through Luke. Luke we felt a lot of, you know, his desire to get off of his planet. Um, but a lot of it was, you know, he was that classic Joseph Campbell hero who, okay, I've been thrust into this scene and then to this scene and this scene, and let me get it uh, uh, accomplished. Whereas the, the Ray character, uh, we just felt, okay, there's a whole biography here that we want to learn about. Mm. You know? Yeah, I thought that was very strong. I mean, in contrast to Disney princesses, um, the common uh, formula is that you have this – this woman, usually a girl who wants to do something in society, and then her father is usually either the tyrant or the dimwit who's preventing her, and society is mm. telling her you can't do this. And usually she's some sort of a beauty queen also as part of her character. And what I appreciated about about uh, the Ray character is no, she's Ray, and everything that's part of her um, made her a very, very strong uh, that, character. Yeah. That's a great point. So, I mean, since we're on the character of Ray now um, – yeah. Guesses. Uh, I mean, they've, uh, you know, in terms of who is she? What is she? Luke Skywalker's daughter? Is she? Uh, uh, is she? Is she a sibling of of Kylo Ren that 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 that, that we haven't, you know, that sort of been teased, but you know, really not mentioned explicitly. So, so I run a, a, a Sunday school here in Chicago, and <laughs> so these these third graders pulled me aside. And they got into a big, heavy discussion with me about about all the, the like the family tree here. They suggested <laughs> these are third graders. They suggested <laughs> that uh, uh, that Ray is actually Luke Skywalker's daughter. And I mentioned the point that okay, well, he's a Jedi. He's not supposed to have kids. And then they said, well, well, Princess Leia is a Jedi, and she has kids. And so I had no response to them. So. <laughs> Well, she's, but, I mean, Jedi, she, she? she's really not. I mean, she might be force sensitive, but she's not really part of the Jedi order. Right. Mm -hmm. if yeah. 
Yeah, uh, there are women in, among the Jedi, right? I mean, there's uh, that yeah. blue woman or right. something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so. there are there are women, and we certainly see them in the, in the prequels. Although to be fair, right, they don't. I mean, I don't think they even have a line. No. Now, someone someone made a video of like all of the 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 female talking parts oh. in the original trilogy. All the female talking parts, not by Princess Leia, and it amounted, I think, to one minute and thirty eight seconds out of wow. six hours of movie. So wow. Yeah. So I think I think it was certainly deliberate, whether it was on Disney's part or or, or Abrams or you know, uh, to not only cast. I mean, yeah, I mean, again, a very strong you know uh, group of actors, but 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 the fact that they all you know you've got you've got like sort of you've got uh, a black character, you've got a Latino like an an, an act, or at least a character played by a Latino actor, you've got certainly you know Daisy uh, Ridley playing you know you know Ray. Um, I, I think do you guys agree that's a sort of deliberate on, on Disney's part. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, it's, uh, one of the unfortunate things about the original trilogy is that I believe there are only two, two, uh, black characters. There's Lando Calrissian and then one guy who is flying, I think, uh, an X-Wing fighter. And, yeah. And like and, ran, random black guard in Bespin, you know? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and so I think it's part of it is, is deliberate and part of it is also just, you know, that we're in a different world than we were in the 1970s and perhaps even in the, in the late 1990s. Well, so and, that's a good and, thing. and I, I think that, uh, you know, John Boyega is just fantastic. I, I, yeah. um, I love the fact that the character as written is, is, you know, there's, there's nothing explicitly, he's not the black stormtrooper, despite what some of these racist yeah. idiots are, are saying online. Yeah. He's a stormtrooper who happens to be black. But, uh, I, I'm very. Or is he Samuel Jackson playing Samuel Jackson as a Jedi Knight? <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. right. You know? Yeah. It was you know, funny, Jedi. Sam Jackson was very, you know, he, campaigned to get that role in the prequels and i wonder if he's kicking himself a little bit now like if i just waited i could have i could have yeah. been in a different set of movies you know mm -hmm. yeah. but uh, yeah i mean I, I i like the fact that you have a generation of kids that's going going to watch these films and when you think about it the star wars brand is such that it's gonna put butts in seats anyway Mm -hmm. So they 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 don't need to worry about oh my gosh are people going to want to watch a black lead character mm -hmm. or female, because who cares? I mean I think that's definitely true, uh, but the choice could be the difference of a hundred million dollars, right? And so mm. Star Wars Episode Seven is going to be a monster hit. That part everyone knows prior to the first trailer being released. Uh, but the question is, is it going to make a, a billion dollars or is it going to make a billion point two dollars? And I think that's where those choices really play out, especially from the business lens. You know, so. That's a good point. That's mm -hmm. a really good point. Yeah, that, that's a, that's a very true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so what, what else sort of worked? What, what, were you, what, what were your thoughts about sort of uh, like Luke Skywalker and, and sort of his very, very limited? I, I mean, I liked that whole thread because I realized after watching the film, the actual film, was all about finding Luke Skywalker. I right. mean, that was literally the whole the, the whole story, including why did the the, the Star Killer people want him? Maybe that's because you know they thought, well, we couldn't come up with a better name, so we're just going to take Luke Skywalker's original name, Star Killer. Right. Anyway, so that's, that's <laughs> just kind of fun. So uh, uh, I like that whole be, uh, build up going all the way until seeing him at the end, and for me, it worked. Uh, mm -hmm. I had a colleague at work who who thought it just went too far, but I enjoyed it. You know, it was nice and satisfying as an ending. Likewise, likewise. No, no. Your your colleague didn't like the fact that he had no dialogue. Mm. Uh, uh, oh no! Are you you're asking me? Um, no, he he felt that it was just taking too long to get to him. Okay, we got to go to this whole planet. Got to go through this to this island. Got to walk up all these stairs. So like, <laughs> get on with it already. And okay, that's interesting. Yeah. For me, it was nicely paced, and it was a perfect setup for whatever was going to happen in the next film. You know, yeah, you I know, think it was very wise. I, I think I, I totally agree, and I and I think that the shot that we get of uh, the close up of, of Luke's face and all the texture and character yeah. and years of experience and stories that we don't know anything about, I think it's just it it that's what I'm. I'm just desperate to find out more about. So yeah. I think it does the trick. Um, I, I will say the the one thing that I 
regret is that uh, we don't we we'll, we'll never get uh, that reunion between the main characters. Mm. Uh, well, we might, barring a flashback. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. You know? Yeah, and of course, who knows? Maybe Han will come back, um, like Anakin and Obi Wan, and say, "Luke, <laughs> go back to Dagobah." Right. No, but in all seriousness, you're right. We're not going to see that reunion, which I think added to to, to the emotion of the moment. I mean, there, I got to admit, there's the sinister part of me that wondered that. Okay, something happened to Leia's accent. Um, you know, <laughs> you know, she had that British tough accent, but it was only a sporadic and, British accent. It was, yeah, that is true. Only when Peter Cushing was around. <laughs> that is true. That is true. And then, you know, here she sounded like I don't know, like a suburban mom or something. <laughs> You know, who probably smoked too many cigarettes. And yeah, I was gonna say. Then I wonder. Me, yeah, maybe, to me, maybe like, something happened to Luke's voice too. Yeah. yeah, who knows? Right. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah agreed. Uh, yeah, I, I felt that Carrie Fisher's role, like in general, I, I just, I, I didn't. One of the things that I felt was missing was that sort of connection. Um, even when you have the reunion between Han and Leia, uh, I, I just didn't understand. The, the whole like what what had happened like uh-huh. maybe they'll flesh this out later in in the, in the subsequent movies but you know why were they uh, essentially estranged after mm-hmm. whatever happened with Kylo Ren or, or mm-hmm. Ben Solo mm-hmm. um, so that's yeah I, I felt that the I don't know the when they when the two characters do meet. I, I didn't feel that, you know what I mean? Like, I, I just didn't yeah. feel the, uh, yeah, yeah. I think they, uh, I, uh, this is me really nitpicking about the writing. I didn't think they had to tell each other, you know, after our son died, I just went about my way. And I went about my way. It's like, I think that <laughs> was true. that was already understood. I think that actually cut away from the emotion of the moment that if they just looked at each other, right. um, um, that's a good you know, point. and just minimize the dialogue emotively, that's usually much stronger. Mm, yeah. It was too much exposition. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's, it's similar to when when Snoke is telling Kylo Ren, you know, yeah. your father, Han Solo. I thought, yeah. father. Did you hear me clearly, Han Solo? <laughs> it's almost like he, he turns to it. the audience and says that basically. <laughs> Everybody hey, got that? About, okay. Can we talk about Snoke? Yeah, um, yeah. I was gonna say that that that's sort of the other like sort of mystery in the movie. Like, who is this mystery? Who is this mysterious supreme leader? So so like so, uh. Uh, silly parts to it first. Uh, I don't know if any other Muslim in the world felt this, but you know when he appeared, I was like, oh my god, that's Al Masih the Jal. He has one eye. He's a giant. Oh my god, it's really him. How do they figure this out? That was one thing. And then you know he's this super giant guy, and his face looks exactly like the face in a couple other J.J. J. Abrams movies, like the the monster in Cloverfield, and then the monster in Super Eight. And I thought, okay, you know, is, is he saying something? But then. Then he's a hologram. Right. So, okay, if he's a hologram, how come he had to be 80 feet tall? Kind of, t- you know, I guess everything's bigger because this is the Star Killer. But, you know, I'm hoping to find out that he's, you know, like four inches tall. <laughs> yeah, that's. What I was saying. I think that should be the twist. He's like Yoda size. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's like Yoda's younger brother. You know. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I felt. Yeah, I, I felt the same way. And and I, and, I, and I've mentioned this to Zaki, but like I, I felt that one of the things that, um, that you know, and we know that it was it was Andy Serkis doing the motion capture for Snoke, and it was mm. you know uh, like like Lupita Nyong uh, like doing the motion capture for Mas Kanata. But I felt mm. that because again. Everything else in the movie was so sort of back to sort of you know uber like very ultra like ultra realistic very you know uh, tangible sets and things like that very real world that 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 almost took me out of the movie like this mm. very obvious CGI uh, motion capture. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, for, for me, I think it was still sufficiently spooky. Um, okay. Like, yeah, I also felt he talked too much. You know. For the Sith, maybe that's one of the problems of the Sith. They just can't control their tongue. And, so, so are you convinced that he is sort of a, a a a Sith Lord? Is he the is he the Darth Plagueis character that's alluded to in the in the new trilogy? You know, in the prequels. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, um, I want to see how they tie everything in together because I don't want it to feel like, all right, you know, the Emperor's dead, so we just got to have another villain. Um, yeah, which I think they can do. So I'm looking forward to how that plays out. But I'm still there's there's like this. I'm sorry, but there's this old Saturday Night Live skit called Tiny Elvis, and he's <laughs> like this four inch tall Elvis. That was Nicholas Cage. Was it? Yeah, 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 I think it was Nicholas Cage. And so <laughs> there is a part of me that's kind of hoping that Snoke is is like 
tiny Elvis. He's like the tiny emperor. You take the hologram away. He's like, hey, here's what I need to do. Because <laughs> that would fit the mythology. It'd be just like the, the, the wizard and the Wizard of Oz. Yeah. You know. So, and and I mean this is this is you know we we we're, we're talking about uh, so much of of the discussion of this film is couched in well we'll see how it goes yeah we'll that see. is true and and that's you know this is the point I I gave the movie a B I gave it a solid mm. B and mm-hmm. it was because overall I enjoyed it I had no issues with it I I it was a positive theatrical experience however I it's impossible to judge it holistically. <laughs> Because we're basically six years away or four years away, whatever it is, from being able to look at the entire story and say, okay, yeah. it mm-hmm. worked. Yeah. Yeah, that is true. Uh, I mean, in terms of the film standing on its own, was I satisfied? And I would still, I would still say yes. But again, uh, my biggest gripe was, uh, was over just the, the, the whole star killer aspect of the plot, um, yeah, which was a major portion of the story. But, um, uh, uh, yeah, overall, I was still satisfied. But yes, I was, I'm eager to find out what happens next, which I think is also a success on the part of the film. I wasn't dreading. I was, I'm hopeful. Mm. Yeah, well, and that, and that's kind of interesting because when you, when you think about, uh, you know, the way many people reacted to the Phantom Menace, I think, I, I've said this before, I think people were a lot more, uh, amenable to the Phantom Menace initially. Mm-hmm. And, and part of that was just like denial, but part of it was because, well, you know, they're just they're building the world. They're building the story. You know, and then mm-hmm. and then Attack of the Clones comes out, and you're like, all right, well, they got a little bit more to get done, but uh, you know, we've got one more. You know, and yeah. and so it wasn't until the prequels finished that you saw sort of the cement harden where people mm-hmm. said, well, the Phantom Menace is the worst one, or Attack of the Clones is the worst mm-hmm. one, the Phantom mm-hmm. is the best one. And, like, you you know, you looked at it holistically, but I mean, I remember very distinctly watching the Phantom Menace the, when it came out. I was going to COD at the time. Mm. And I, I went to an early show so that I could write my review and have it in for that, that week's paper. I remember that. Mm-hmm. And and I came home and everybody in the office was like, what'd you think? And I was like, eh, you know. And, yeah. And, and I was one of the few people. And I, and I remember I tore it apart, but I gave it a B plus. Mm. So now in hindsight, would you say that Phantom Menace is better than Force Awakens? Phantom Menace is not better than Force Awakens. Um, <laughs> it it does, But it does have things that, that I, I recommend. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I actually I, I wrote a, an, a chapter in, in a book that just came out a couple weeks ago, uh, a, a book about the Star Wars franchise, and my chapter was about the prequels. Mm. And mm. I was tasked with do something positive about the prequels, mm-hmm. and I was mm-hmm. like, no problem. And then I mm-hmm. sat down and I was like pulling my hair out because uh, of, sure. why did I agree to this? But I mean, what it does well, what the prequel films do well, in my opinion, is to really lay out the political machinations yeah. that go into the fall of a republic. I agree. I agree wholeheartedly with that point. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think Palpatine's plan, when you look at it, it. Mm works i mean it it's mm-hmm. you see his maneuverings um mm-hmm. and and i i like how it starts very innocuously with you know this whole business with the trade federation where we're like what the hell is this taxation of trade routes but it's yeah. this completely seemingly unconnected thing that you connect the dots leads to an entire galactic republic collapsing mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. i think that's uh, <sighs> yeah i mean two thoughts uh when dark knight rises came out uh, I finally understood the thread that was running through the first two films, the first two Batman films mm-hmm. that I thought, Oh, this is what's going on in terms of, of the whole story, not just with the, the collapse of Gotham, but what is Batman really trying to do? It didn't occur to me until the third film that Batman is trying to basically be a band aid uh, until the rest of the city can right. rise up and, and, and take on the role of saving the city. And I finally watched all three films going through it with, with my daughters and my son in this, uh, uh, in the past week. And just exactly what you said, suddenly everything all made sense to me. And I think part of what I had to go through was just an academic study, which involved a lot of study of history to see how history plays out. And then I thought, Oh, okay. And exactly what you just described, Zucky, the, the whole collapse of the, of, of the empire, the strategy of Palpatine. And how everything worked. Uh, it also reminded me. I don't know if you guys like the film Cloud Atlas. I did. A, one one of the things that I really appreciated about Cloud Atlas. It also has some problems in terms of how minorities are depicted. But one thing I really appreciated about the film was that uh, the thread from start to finish of all the different stories was that in the background you had the rise and fall of this corporation, 
that, that was taking place. It starts from the days of slavery and then it grows and grows and grows. It collapses, the economy collapses. And then there's, there's the fallout with, with the chronologically the last por uh, uh, portion of, of the story. And that's what I started feeling as I was watching the, uh, the trilogies this, this new time around. Hmm. So. Yeah. I, I mean, I think, I think the, to me, the, the problem with those films was in, in trying to, in, in tying in, uh, Anakin Skywalker's fall explicitly with the fall of the Republic. I think, um, there's just, it created too many narrative problems for me, but, mm. but the, the overarching, the, the political aspect of it, I think is quite compelling. Mm -hmm. And, and Lucas has said as much. I mean, you know, he talked about, it. he's like, look at history, look at how yeah. dictators rise. And I mean, again, it's, 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 you know, it, it saddens me a little bit because I think the, I think that the films did not measure up to his ambitions for them. Mm. Yeah, and I don't know if if uh, that is possible. I mean, if we if we frame this back to when he's writing Star Wars, the original story, uh, you know, he starts making it in the mid seventies. It gets released in seventy seven. This is as America has just come out of Vietnam, and at that time, the westerns more than the war movies were the criticisms of, of Vietnam. And you definitely see both the influence of war movies and westerns on Star Wars, right? You know the way everyone's dressed. Luke is dressed in white. Darth Vader's in black. Sure. And and I remember some quote somewhere where he said that you know uh, to talk about politics, he had to make a sci-fi film. And hmm. and I think that is something that's been lost in the, in the whole conversation. That it is this whole trilogy, or I mean, not the whole trilogy, but all six films, and perhaps the seventh. I mean, it is a very heavy political commentary you know, about how society works and how empires rise and fall. Now, I mean, talk, you know, we're talking about George Lucas. Do you, do yeah. you think that, do you, do you think that he, you know, he had any regrets about, I mean, he, how can you have too, too many regrets about yeah. being made a billionaire, but certainly he, he was shackled to this franchise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I wonder about that. I mean, like from, you know, speaking, you know, of uh, invoking our film school side of these things, uh, right. you know, the, uh, your movie is your child. And, and so, uh, I don't know that a parent, you know, finds himself thinking, God, I should, I wish I didn't have this children, except in those moments where the child misbehaves, you know, <laughs> you know? um, and so, I think, yeah, part of it, he probably did feel shackled and part of it is probably that he felt that, okay, this gave me uh, a life that I could never have imagined. I mean, I'd be interested in seeing what he has to say about all this. I think Zeki on Facebook, you posted that article uh, where he mentions that, okay, I have never been able to experience the force the way yeah. audience members will. And I thought that was really interesting, something had never uh, occurred to me. And then I realized how narcissistic the whole experience has been. You know, hmm. what does Star Wars mean to me? What is, you know, what do the Jedi mean to me? And, um, and the filmmakers themselves, whether it's Lucas or, or Mark Hamill, you know, for them, uh, I'd be curious to, to find out all of their stories. What does it all mean to them, uh, before, during, and after? Well, and, and that, that in and of itself is so fascinating, right? Like, yeah. you you know, at what point, and this is almost, it's an open question, right? At what mm -hmm. point do you, as the creator of the work, uh -huh. lose ownership of that work? Because, yeah. because that's been the dialectic, you know, obviously ever since the special editions and the tweaking and the tweaking, people, you know, there's this visceral rage, leave them alone, leave them alone. And, mm -hmm. and you know, we see now Spielberg and Lucas are two very close friends, but they have two very different views on this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because, What's the, yeah, go ahead. Well, well, Spielberg made changes to E.T., yeah. which he then reversed mm -hmm. because he said it belongs to the audience. Mm -hmm. And and George Lucas almost defiantly mm -hmm. has said, look, if you don't like the way the imperfect version of my film, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that is fascinating. I mean, the way you, you present them, it almost is like comparing Steve Jobs with Bill Gates. You know, they sure. have two very different outlooks on, on how to do business and, and, and such. And so Steve Jobs was very proprietary and, and Bill Gates was just letting everybody have windows. And <laughs> yeah, I mean... It is art is a conversation and business is a conversation. Movies are both. And, and so when someone is making a big, heavy choice like that, uh, it could be driven by pocketbook or it's being done despite, uh, the pocketbook. Um, 
But yeah, I mean, we own what Star Wars means for us, right? We right. own what ET means for us. And the open marketplace of ideas allows us to shout and scream and say, no, this is mine, not yours, even though you made it, you gave it to me, and you know everything else behind it. Yeah. <laughs> So I mean, as as we as we look as we sort of uh, start winding this conversation down, uh, what 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 would you like to see happening with this franchise? I mean, we know now that Star Wars will be outlasting all of us. Yeah. And and one thing I, I you know I I was talking uh, um, I was talking to my co-host on my other show about how th- there is sort of a, a process here where that I've had to realize where this is now going from, it, you know, Star Wars used to be uh, the Godfather in essence, beginning, yeah. middle, end. Yeah. And now it's going to be James Bond. Yeah. Or Marvel. Yeah. And- you know, and and now now the the and I would actually argue that it's it's sort of a hybrid of the two in that this is by virtue of the fact that this is a continuing saga, we have the ability to have characters enter the narrative and leave the narrative, and so it gives us, uh, you know, for example, we we see Han Solo uh, for a little while, he leaves. You know, Obi Wan Kenobi's our lead for a little while, he leaves. You know, and mm-hmm. and potentially can continue for several more trilogies. Mm-hmm. It's. Um, and I think I think that's uh, that's fascinating. You know, it's it's uh, potentially unlike anything we've had before in in the realm of film. Yeah, it's. Uh, um, I think ultimately, what I'd like is for it to still just keep capturing capturing my imagination with narrative. Uh, I don't think it can do that with mythology, uh, hmm. just because. I mean, just like the people say, you know, the book is better than the movie, but the imagination is better than the book. <laughs> and, and and so the point being that um, I don't think it can blow my mind, um, but I think it can still generate some interesting stories. I mean, the James Bond example is good because when a new James Bond movie is coming out, I know I'm probably eventually going to go see it. Right. And just because I've seen the other 25 or so. And but once in a while, uh, there's a James Bond movie that is just absolutely fantastic. And. So I'm not, uh, I'm not expecting every film to be great. I'm not expecting every film to be a home run, but I am really hoping that it's worth my two hours that I, that I give to it, um, each time a new movie comes out. And who knows? I mean, when, like the movie that's coming out next, is that like Rebels or something? The one that's coming out next uh, it's year? called Rogue One, I believe, in December. Rogue One. Year. Yeah. Yeah. And so our connection is to characters. Uh, it's not connection to a universe. And so yeah, if it doesn't have, if it doesn't have any characters that I'm interested in, then I'm guessing I'm probably not going to go to the, you know, the first night. I'll probably eventually see it. Um, well, and, and when you think about it, I mean, that movie is almost the bigger test of, yeah. of Disney's investment because you knew people were going to show up for episode seven. Yeah, exactly. Um, that you're, you're absolutely right that this next film is really going to test what is the whole future. And is Disney, for example, going to get its $4 billion back? Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm curious. Uh, uh, but yeah, it really comes down to the characters more than the, than the mythology. Now, uh, this is a question that I wanted to ask you, and this is this is only tangentially connected to what we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, I, I remember you were a big booster in 2009 of oh. Avatar. Uh-huh. I loved it. Yeah. And so, so now we are <laughs> promised three more of these uh-huh. that they've been making for uh, however however many years now. And my, my contention is for as much as I enjoyed Avatar as a theatrical experience, yeah. I didn't I didn't feel the, the driving need to revisit that universe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, the second, well, maybe the third time I saw Avatar, uh, then that's when it really started becoming flat. Sure. Right? And all the criticisms that people had, this is Dancing with Wolves with Blue People, all that stuff, all that stuff was, was valid. Um, but yeah, Avatar... Uh, the major portion of Avatar was the theatrical experience. Uh, the character decisions, by and large, were all predictable. And um, I think uh, what's nice about the success of Force Awakens is that I think it requires Avatar to to really be of high quality, both as film spectacle as well as hopefully, you know, character driven story. Yeah, I mean, yeah. and that's like I'm I'm genuinely. Uh, we're wondering about that because I, I feel like James Cameron, I, I'm, I'm almost like I, I, I had no problem with Avatar, but I want to see Cameron do another stuff. Yeah. Um, and, you know, 
Did he? Has he made a film uh, like a, a feature film since Avatar? Nothing, as far as I know. Him, yeah, if he like he had those those three D like museum type films. I don't know. I think that might have been before Avatar. Those anyway. are before, as far as I know. Yeah, I mean, he's basically yeah. moved into Pandora. He's he's gone full Jake <laughs> Sully on us. Okay, yeah. So so yeah, I'm curious to see what what he has uh, more in store. I mean, it's and when you think about it, it's a big gamble uh, that they've got three more of these in 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 the pipeline. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, my my daughter raised a point to me. Uh, we were having a conversation about how someone who is younger does not really have an appreciation of what Star Wars was when it first came out. How it was a complete game changer for everything. I mean, aside from what what it did for in terms of Hollywood, but just the movie experience, right? right. And. And even like a friend of mine was mentioning that we haven't even had a movie like that from Spielberg, like what Indiana, what the first Raiders of the Lost Ark was, what Jurassic Park was. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think uh, what we're all longing for is that spectacle film that just changes everything. And I mean, I don't know if you have any thoughts. What was the last film that actually did something like that? Uh, The conversation I always have is I wonder if I'm just too old to have my mind blown that same way. Cause I'm just not a kid anymore. Yeah. That's probably a big part of it. And I think, uh, when you're getting older, you've already seen everything. You've already heard all the stories. You've already heard all the Jama chutbahs, you know, uh, <laughs> and then, you know, you're always waiting for that certain someone to just shake the earth. Um, and so maybe it's just not possible. Uh, but yeah, I think the movies themselves make us hopeful that it can happen again. Yeah. Well, and that's, that's a great uh, place to wrap this conversation up. Okay. Now, uh, Omar, you are a, a very active online presence. Where are some of the places people can find you? Uh, I'm occasionally posting jokes on, on Twitter, and then uh, I write essays for RogerEbert.com. And uh, otherwise, I'm just humoring myself, as I said, alone in my car. <laughs> <laughs> well, and uh, um, what's, your, what's your Twitter account? Uh, Muzaffar, M-O-Z-A-F-F-A-R. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I hope people will add you to their follow list because it's always amusing. Thank you very much. Yeah. And and interesting, not just <laughs> um, and And as for our show, you can find us at our Facebook page, facebook.com slash Diffuse Congruence. Also, you can email us at diffusecongruence at gmail.com. And uh, we lost uh, Pervez due to some technical issues. But on behalf of Pervez and myself, I want to wish our audience a very happy uh, holiday season. And today is uh, uh, Mila the Nabi, so. Uh, yes. So uh, no. greater than any Jedi. <laughs> Robert, <he's real. laughs> and uh, we'll catch you next year. Thank you for listening.